Hi, uh, my name is Mark Bowman. I'm the Chicago Region Program Director in the Science Action Center here at the Field Museum. And this is one of those nights when I feel that every word in that title counts. It's about science. It's about the actions we can take. It's certainly about the Chicago region. Um, it's right here. And uh, we're so glad that you could make it tonight. And especially happy to partner with the University of Chicago's Program on Global Environment, which has done such a fabulous job in preparing students and in preparing citizens to think about the important questions that face us. Uh, we have a great program tonight. Um, I'm just going to say a few housekeeping things. Uh, this particular program is the last in a series of understanding extinction patterns that began with a sad reflection on the uh, 100th anniversary of the death of, of Martha, the last uh, passenger pigeon, but moved through a series of things that point out that extinction isn't the only future uh, that nature faces. That in cities, and maybe especially because of cities, We've got certain things that we can look forward to and plan for. And I think that's the general tenor of tonight's conversation is, what can we do in this urban environment, not only to make a home for nature, but um, to really be the thing that nature needs, perhaps, in this world of 50% urbanites and the 7.5 billion people. The housekeeping thing I wanted to say, very important information, is that the restrooms are straight through the lobby and to the end of the lobby and then a left. So go to the clock and then to the left and you'll find our uh, restrooms there. And what we'll do tonight is we have a panel conversation. Um, in just a second, I'm going to introduce my colleague, Abigail Derby Lewis, who uh, really led our effort to get the panel together. Um, each presenter will speak. Um, while we do a little transition, there may be a moment for a question or two. But at the end of the presentations, we'll have everybody come up to the stage. Um, and we'll have an interactive conversation here and certainly have opportunities to take many more of your questions uh, after that. So once again, thank you very much for coming. And Abigail, are you nearby? You are. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, thanks so much for joining us here this evening. Uh, as Mark mentioned, um, I'm also in the Science Action Center. I'm a conservation ecologist, and I'm very excited for this conversation tonight. I think that this is a topic that is of equal interest to scientific specialists as it is to anyone who's ever seen anything flying or buzzing around their backyard. People are very interested in pollinators writ large. And so we're going to hopefully have a really interesting conversation tonight. Um, the very first speaker that we're very excited to have here um, from the West Coast, Dr. Victoria Wolchek. And uh, Vicki is the research director of the Pollinator Partnership, which is a nonprofit organization that works toward the conservation of pollinators across North America. She oversees the research program, which is focused on pollinator habitat conservation and landscape management assessments, land use and pesticide policy review, and support for threatened and critical species, as well as ecosystem service assessments. Vicki's own research interests center on the impacts that humans have on the environment, and she's currently investigating how agricultural and industrial landscapes can be managed to enhance pollinator populations and ecosystem services. She works with many partners to create conservation tools that farmers, growers, industry regulators, and the general public can use to help pollinators, um, which is the basis of our conversation this evening. So please join me in welcoming Vicki. Okay, we'll tee you up here. Nope, I just ended your. <laughs> and we're done, thank you. Here we go. That'll work well. Yeah, <laughs> nice. Just for you, that was easy. <laughs> Excellent. Um, thanks, everyone, for having me here today. So um, 
Abigail gave a great background on what it is that I do. I have an absolute obsession and interest in urban ecology and urban ecosystems, but my role tonight is to present more of the background story on pollinators and look at presenting you with ideas on, in the large scale, large scope, how pollinators can interact with your actions and pollinator conservation can be promoted. So I'm going to set up the two other speakers we have today for their more detailed uh, studies. So, um, it's fine by me. I, I like doing thematic as well as data-rich talks, so I'll stay away from the numbers uh, for the first bit of today's talk. Uh, what I wanted to, I titled my presentation Pollinators in a Changing Climate because there really is a positive spin at the end of this. There certainly is this overarching element of climate change and impacts that humans have that have modified the environment for pollinators. But as, you, as we go through the presentation, you'll see and you've probably become aware yourself that the climate that we live in, not the temperature and precipitation climate, but our social and political climate has really changed, I'll say positively for pollinators, very, very recently especially, with some um, political actions that have come forth. So it's, it's a positive time and things are changing for pollinators. Maybe the negatives are balancing the positives. So just quick outline, we'll talk about pollinators, current issues, this changing climate, and some action items that can be taken by various stakeholders to support pollinators. I like to start by talking about what pollination is because I think it's really important in understanding why pollinators matter. So pollination could have absolutely nothing to do with a pollinator. It's the movement of pollen. It's taking a pollen grain from an anther to a stigma. So male part of the flower goes to the female part of the flower and an egg is fertilized. That's pollination. That's how plants make more plants. But this is why pollinators matter. Pollination can happen by self-fertilization. There's a lot of plants that are capable of doing that. The wind can move pollen, water can move pollen, that's a little less common, but it, it is a system. Or animals can actually move that pollen. So plants can make more plants on their own, but it can take, other factors can actually help this along. In terms of pollinators moving pollen, plants have developed this kind of relationship with them where they reward them with food to ensure they come visit them. So pollen's a protein source, nectar is a carbohydrate, and you get uh, more animals visiting you, you ensure that your pollen will be moved. But why exactly does this matter? And here's the reason why pollinators matter. So pollination does not necessarily require pollinators. But depending on where you're physically located, geographically, between 60 to 96% of the plants in the landscape uh, require pollinators. So that's why they matter. You would not have the large uh, proportion of plants reproducing if you didn't have pollinators. I'll just answer this question now because it always comes up, what a big range. Well, what does this range stand for? The um, latitudes closer towards the equator tend to have higher pollinator dependence, and as you move further north and south, uh, you get landscapes that are grass and um, coniferous plant dominated. So if we go much more north than we are here, you could see a number around 60% dependence. But generally speaking, in North America, uh, we like to say around 80% of the plants out there are pollinator dependent. That's still the vast majority of plant species out there. So that's why you need pollinators. And if you didn't believe that you need it just because the majority of plants need pollination from an animal, We'll talk about briefly the ecosystem services, a term you've probably heard before, quite popular, um, or become quite popularized. Ecosystem services that are either dependent or supported by pollinators. Pollination, we already talked about that. But what about food production? So here's another huge one. The food that we eat is reliant on pollinators in large part. 1,000 of the 1,200 most common crops that we grow, that's not species, it's varieties, but of the, the things we grow, the vast majority, 1,000 of the 1,200 globally, are pollinator dependent. Now this translates for our diets to one of every three bites of food we eat, and the number is only 30% because we eat quite a few grains in our diets. So wheat and corn and rice are not pollinator dependent, they're wind pollinated, um, or self-pollinating. 
But the rest of our diet, and certainly the most nutritious part of our diets, is pollinator dependent. And even the meat and dairy industry, those components of our diet, at least in North America, are substantially supported by pollinators because of the feed that dairy cattle eat, as well as, as beef cattle. And we do know from a lot of research, here's a, a good example from a recent publication, that when you do remove pollinators from a system, you do get declines in yield. So it's not just an assumption, there is proof behind this. How much does this actually benefit the economy? Because often when you're talking conservation, especially in food systems, you really need to think dollars and cents because the economic models have already been very well developed for cropping systems. They grow what they grow because it makes a profit because the system's fine-tuned. So $217 billion in global crop production, that's a big number, bigger than I'm used to dealing with, is directly related to insect pollination. That's 84% of Europe's crops. If you want to look at just U.S. numbers, $6.1 billion directly from honeybees and $3.1 billion from native bees, so non-honeybees. Really big numbers that you would not have without the action of these pollinators. Moving outside of agriculture, what else do pollinators give us? Raw materials, hardwoods, textiles, fabrics, dyes, uh, products for pharmaceuticals. So all of these things that are plant-derived that we don't always think about because sometimes we interact with the product once it's been processed more. They're pollinator dependent, so we wouldn't have those. Recreational value and the maintenance of uh, beautiful ecosystems, the ecosystems that species rely on, um, even if you want to look at wildlife viewing or, or hunting and fishing activities, those ecosystems are quite dependent on pollinators to support them. And then a little, now moving a little bit indirectly here, supported ecosystems. So we can make a direct connection even though sometimes it's a little bit difficult with dollars and cents or connections of pollinator service and this service. Uh, and the impacts we feel. But there's a couple uh, indirect services that we certainly all benefit from that pollinators support, such as climate regulation. So a lot of the forests that do provide the air filtration and climate regulation carbon sequestration services are hardwood species that are pollinator dependent. So that's a, a long-term growing species that is pollinator dependent. And if we lose pollinators, that capacity of the forests to um, moderate climates and um, sequester carbon can be diminished. Erosion control, this is one that coming from the West Coast in California is a little bit more familiar to, to me, but uh, along riparian areas here, you have the same issues of vegetation along streams and hillsides that holds and stabilizes the soil. That vegetation is providing a service to keep the landscape as it is, to prevent runoff and erosion, and it's pollinator dependent in large part. So you remove the pollinators from that system, eventually your plant community will either transition or you'll lose them, and you won't have the same service. A fun little one as well, the physical actions of many pollinators, like the digging into the ground that bees do to make their nests, help cycle nutrients. So they all provide us with a little benefit. And then this is a fun slide, maybe it's a little garish, but uh, ecosystem services, uh, the cultural support that we get from the environment is a verified ecosystem service. And these are just some examples that I very quickly got from searching the internet for, you know, bees and art and bees and toys and bees and other factors and pollinators in particular are actually quite integrated into a lot of cultures. Uh, a lot of religious texts mention them. Um, they're often used in a lot of rites and rituals so we, we would lose a lot of the cultural components we have as humans if pollinators disappeared. So it's kind of everything that they support. <clears throat> so how is the climate changing for pollinators? This is the uh, slower part of the presentation where we do admit absolutely that there have been huge losses, primarily in habitat, that are threatening pollinators. Species that are well studied are documented to decline. Um, the, I'm going to leave the numbers off myself, but there are huge declines in a lot of pollinator species. There's some we don't know anything about, so we can't actually say if they're declining or not. Disease is a factor. Parasites are a factor, invasive species are a factor, pesticide misuse, and climate change. But 
Primarily, it's the loss of actual habitat, the place where they live, that's the biggest factor to contend with. If you removed all of the other issues that impact pollinators but still didn't provide habitat, you wouldn't have the opportunity to maintain, restore, and increase populations. So habitat is key. Now for a few specifics about the pollinators we know about and who's actually declining. Uh, it's an issue that was very current in the news, colony collapse disorder, uh, plagued honeybees in the United States and in Europe. This issue hasn't been documented. Uh, that does not mean, uh, has not been documented in recent years, so it was uh, very prevalent in 2007, 2008, but the problems in bee health still persist today. So this is an example of the health of managed honeybee colonies being significantly impacted. There's four species of bumblebees that are in severe decline, um, and disease development and climate change are considered to drive these factors. They're Bombus franklini, which is Franklin's bumblebee, Bombus occidentalis, the western bumblebee, Bombus tericola, and then Bombus affinis. So tericola and affinis are more um, eastern species that you may have seen at one time, but probably would not see to, uh, today very commonly. A whole group of bees called yellow face bees are in decline. Now this group of bees is really common in Hawaii. It's their only endemic species of bee. And our habitat destruction through agricultural intensification development and um, human developments is the leading driver of this particular bee group's decline. Um, Hawaii is an island, so they're, uh, the colonization and diversification of economies and human settlements on Hawaii obviously is removing one form of habitat in favor of another, and the habitat for these bees is quite diminished. The carnivore blue butterfly is a butterfly species that's endangered. The monarch butterfly migration is in jeopardy, so this is an interesting nuance where we don't have the species as in danger because the numbers are high, but they're not moving the way they used to move. And the lesser long-nosed bat, a species that's not common up here, it's more of a southern desert species, is also listed as endangered. So these are all pollinators that are facing decline. Loss of pollinators equals loss of pollinator functions. And we just went through the list of what pollinators give to us, so we know what's going to happen if we lose pollinators. But uh, I'm going to switch to some positives right now. There's, there is a changing climate for pollinators in terms of awareness and opportunities to actually restore these important species and integrate them into a lot of our activities. So habitat improvement, stakeholder education, research and policy support. Those areas are areas in which my organization, Pollinator Partnership, is really, really active, but a lot of other um, nonprofits, researchers, uh, institutions are quite active in these elements as well because they, they present opportunities for us to actually turn pollinators around so they don't have to go the way of the passenger pigeon. And as I mentioned before, helping pollinators really means supporting their habitat. Unfortunately, pollinator habitat is beautiful. It's just great. It's the local floral community that everyone appreciates. Um, so there's an easy sell there, but there's still a, a better and a worse way to achieve functional pollinator habitat. So I'll just give a brief talk, a um, couple seconds, to the organization I work for. Pollinator Partnership um, is a nonprofit that's focused on pollinators. We've been focused on pollinators uh, for two decades now. So before they became trendy and in the news, we've, we've been working on them because we realize that they're quite important. Um, we do outreach, education, research, and partnership. And because habitat's a key factor for survival, um, and we know, so it's not up here, but we know that you know, if, if we had all the money in the world, we still wouldn't be able to buy up or collect all that critical habitat that we need for pollinators. So we know that the right way to do this is to work closely with stakeholders that are impacting, managing, and using habitats and help them protect their own habitat, restore or manage their own habitat to support pollinators. And we have a lot of memoranda of understanding with land management agencies, and most recently, if you did hear um, back in June, the presidential memorandum was signed that actually recognized the importance of pollinators and the fact that they would absolutely figure strongly in the existing land management activities of all federal agencies. So this was actually a huge factor about how the climate, the political climate has actually changed for pollinators. Um, and this, 
I think this particular action spoke quite strongly, not so much as making an appropriation and saying, here is a fund, uh, some funds for pollinators, go use them to protect pollinators, but instead saying that pollinators have to be part of your current plan. The way you do stuff must include pollinators. So that's a, that's a great way to do it, and that's the approach we support. So some of the partners we work with, just a splatter of logos here, but you see that they span the entire North American continent. We're a trilateral organization because pollinators don't respect political boundaries. They go where they see fit. So we work through Canada, the US, and Mexico to help protect pollinators in their ecological regions, not just their political regions. <clears throat> and we do this by enabling stakeholders to take the action themselves. Uh, there's only one of me. Our staff is limited. I, would love to do all this work myself, but I can't. But if I can encourage everyone in this room to plant the right plants in their landscape, that makes a huge difference. And that's also an area where the urban community can significantly stand out because you have so many individual stakeholders um, with little parcels of land that they control within an urban area. What th their collective actions really do matter. They matter just as much as a large land management agency that has 100 acres or so that they manage. <coughs> So we have a set of eco-regional planting guides where you put in your zip code and you're given a list of plants that are appropriate to your region and attract pollinators. The eco-regional planting guides are also available in an app version, being very 21st century here. Uh, and the app actually gives you a little bit more quick freedom to select your favorite pollinator. You want flies in your garden? Perfect. Select flies, filter for flies. They're super important, trust me. They're not as nice as bees and butterflies aesthetically, but you can get a sub list of plants that are great for monarchs, for flies, for bees, for other butterflies, for bats, if they're in your region. And we have a program that helps you document your actions. So it's a registration of your pollinator habitat and a share program. If you go to uh, our share website, you can put a pinpoint on the map where you live, and that is your pollinator habitat. And it's a way to understand where we have pollinator habitat and where there are still some gaps. So it's a really great tool. We work with school kids to help them understand pollinators. And then I mentioned stakeholders really loosely. We work with a lot of different stakeholders because everyone can do something in the way that they interact with their landscape to help pollinators. So here's a subsample of some of the outreach brochures we've created that help drive actions, either specific to certain pollinator types, to the utility industry, to pesticide applicators, to land managers, uh, people that have various uh, religious and community affiliations, most religious organizations have some kind of area in front of their building where they could plant something. Why not plant something that's spiritually important and uh, representative of religious texts and also helps pollinators? So we, we really are reaching out to everyone and their, the ways that they can help. Managed landscapes, which urban landscapes are certainly part of this, are actually ideal for supporting pollinators, I think. You have to understand how pollinators interact with each landscape change habits and behaviors of the landscape manager, which in many cases is you, the home gardener, and then create and implement pollinator-friendly management regimes. So I'll give you a quick overview of three little programs that we have for land managers that are larger scale than, than most of the people in this room and leave more of the urban uh, interactions to the other speakers. But we work with utility rights of way. So utility rights of way are, are corridors. They're great areas of habitat. They're really intensively managed. We've had a program where we've added bee housing, increased native herb species, herbaceous species, reduced mowing, reduced herbicide use, removed some nasty non-natives, and this is out in California where yellow star thistle is a really, really aggressive invasive species. And that transitions the landscape into having actually a nicer landscape with a diverse floral community, more bees, and more housing opportunities for bees. So here's a before and after shot. I mean, one's a close up and one's a far away shot, but of what a utility corridor that's just mowed seasonally looks like, or one that's targeted with IVM, which is integrated vegetation management, how that corridor can look when you actually manage it 
in a slightly different way than you were going to anyway. So we have a huge program where we work with utilities and help shift their behaviors into more pollinator sensitive utility management. And if you imagine how much utility there is out there, there's an estimated um, 800,000 miles of utility corridors in the US alone. So that's a huge potential that could be pollinator habitat. It might already be. So maybe we have to take a look and document it. But it's a big benefit. In our studies of implementing results, uh, implementing these programs in California, we had 30% more nesting and 30% more species when we did this. So that was huge. I have to speak a little bit quickly because I'm running out of time. The monarchs, a million monarchs migrate each year north and south along their traditional migratory routes. Here's another example of utilities and the parallels you can see on this map of where monarchs move and where major utility corridors are. So again, working with this kind of model, we take advantage of the utility corridor. So we have a series of resources, planting guides for you, the homeowner, and planting guides for the utility manager to help them support monarchs. And we've also looked at industrial restorations and how you can mix in pollinator seeds into standard restoration practices, which often look at just putting grasses, which stabilize the soil, into a seed mix and waiting for the landscape to take over. Well, we've worked with some programs where we include pollinator benefiting plants into these early restoration mixes, and our resort results are really quite fantastic. This was a landscape that was scraped to the bone because it had to be for contaminated reasons. It was a, um, a rocket engine <coughs> development and test site in Southern California. So they had to put back something and uh, we worked with them to convince them to go a step further than just the native grass mix, put in some pollinator plants. And we had similar results here where on landscapes that were just restored without any pollinators uh, thought in mind, we have twice as many pollinators on the pollinator landscape. Kind of a no-brainer, but you know. <laughs> So how can cities and urbanites help? You guys are large population zones. You're consumers of ecosystem services and products. Um, if there's education and awareness in your community, you can actually take the action. Urban landscapes are a refugia. I'm not going to be the only one that says this. And you're actually a voting public, and you vote lots of different ways. You vote politically when you cast the ballot, but you also vote with the choices you make, the plants you buy, the food you choose to eat. So, Last little example um, of a program we had that worked with educating the urban public, a bee condo development program with one of our partners, Birds Bees. Various models of bee condos distributed throughout the landscape. Um, maybe not the biggest boost to bee habitat, but public awareness. So what can you do to help? I'll leave this slide up before I get the hook, but you can transform your landscape. You can use the tools that are out there and let your voice be heard politically and in terms of your pocketbook. Thanks very much for having me. Thank you so much. If you want to um, stand up here for just a moment, while I bring up um, the next speaker's presentation, if there is one like burning question that somebody wants to ask. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, there was a, uh, articles about the decrease in the monarch butterflies because of uh, herbicides on uh, milk leaves. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're trying to... Yes, so uh, I, yeah, I'll answer that question. But so the monarch migration goes through various parts of the continent, various habitat areas. A huge portion of the monarch migration flies through the corn belt, so Midwestern states that grow a lot of corn. And in the herbicide <coughs> use data that we have actually comes out of um, University of Kansas Lawrence, Dr. Chip Taylor's work, where if you look at increased acreages of uh, GMO, uh, GMO corn that's resistant to Roundup, then, and you map monarch declines, there's a parallel increase in acreage and a decline in monarchs, because the result is, it's not actually the action of the herbicide on the insect itself, but the pervasive use of the herbicide product that is eliminating weedy species that were in ditches and along roadsides. So it's an indirect kind of hit to the monarch population. They'd be flying through a farmer's field and find a perfectly acceptable milkweed in the ditch. The farmer's not spraying that milkweed. He's spraying his corn, but the drift hits the milkweed because you can be a little bit more flexible if you're using a roundup ready variety. So that's the, the data behind uh, the comment you're referring to. Thank you so much. And we'll have an opportunity to ask Vicki some additional questions.
Uh, before we move on to our, our next speaker, just a shout out to the Shed Aquarium, who, speaking of um, milkweed, brought packets of milkweed. Um, whoever was here beforehand and was able to, to get that nice little swag, thanks so much for doing that, um, and happy planting. So next up, we have Dr. Ralph Grundell. Uh, Ralph is a research ecologist in the USGS uh, Great Lakes Science Center located in Porter, Indiana, at the Indiana National Dunes. His current research interests include improving the scientific basis for savanna restoration in the Midwest, pollinator ecology, animal migrations, endangered species, and climate change effects on species and habitats. Um, these days, he is also working on a conservation design for wetland and upland restora restoration in the Kankakee uh, River watershed, and on the implementation of standards for habitat restoration under the U.S.-Canada Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement. Um, I had to include this because it was hilarious, Ralph. Ralph likes hiking through mountain landscapes, which he is still trying to reconcile with living in Indiana. So, <laughs> Ralph. The uh, truth hurts, what can I say? <laughs> so I um, plagiarized this title from a well-known article by E.O. Wilson, um, The Little Things That Run the World. And uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the work that we've done looking at uh, the function and of uh, pollinators in the landscapes around Chicago and some of the uh, good and bad things that seem to be happening to them. Let's see. Okay. This is down here? No. Arrow? Down. Ooh, I see. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. And I thought I'd start by putting out a quote from a recent paper in a scientific journal where these uh, French researchers looked at uh, pollinators, especially wild bees, along an urbanization gradient near Lyon, France. And they noted that urban areas supported a diverse bee community, but sites with an intermediate level of urbanization had the most species. The presence of a diverse array of bee species, even in the most urbanized areas, can raise the awareness of urban citizens about biodiversity. And I think in large part that's what our uh, goal here is in today's um, talks. This is a collage of pictures of butterflies that we have found um, just in the sh uh, nearby sh uh, part of Indiana, just over the border from uh, Chicago. This is a collage. Uh, in the previous collage, we saw uh, each of the butterfly species. and this, we see one representative from each of the genera of bees, native bees, that we have found in northwest Indiana during the course of our studies. So in the previous uh, uh, slide, uh, I said that one of the things we're trying to promote in this discussion today is an appreciation of the diversity that lives in our backyards. And the fantastic variability and diversity that we see in these two pictures, I think, drives home that message. The work that I'm going to describe, a lot of it has been done at the Indiana Dunes, just over the border. You can see you are here, and the Indiana Dunes is just around the bend of uh, Lake Michigan. And in the course of our studies, we've looked a lot at the interactions between pollinators and the plants that they pollinate. And this simple graph um, <laughs> illustrates on the top, it's all the bees that we found listed, and on the bottom, the plant species that we've seen them pollinate. So you can see here, for example, there's some plant species that there's a single pollinator that we found. <coughs> On the other hand, there's this little sweat bee here that we found pollinating over 60 different plant species. <coughs> there's some plant species that seem to have an association with a single bee, and there's other plant species, such as this wood woodland sunflower, that seems to be visited by dozens and dozens of bee species. So uh, I could sort of stop right there and uh, say that we probably accomplished our mission in this talk by giving you an idea of the diversity and the intricacy of the relationships that pollinators have in our landscapes, just in our backyards, literally. Um, but there are challenges. So uh, the Indiana Dunes, where a lot of this work was done, this is what it looked like uh, you know, in years gone by on the top. And this is the matrix in which the Indiana Dunes is embedded in the bottom. Heavy industry, 
agriculture, urban development. And so one of the things we've been interested in in our studies is just how well uh, these pollinators and their pollinate, the plants that they pollinate, how well they've done uh, under these change conditions. So uh, what have we learned from our studies of pollinators? Uh, we've learned that they respond often to very local habitat conditions. We've learned that size matters. Uh, as Vicki was just saying, we found the importance of habitat quantity and the connections between habitats for the survival of these species. We found that timing is of the essence so that the timing uh, between these uh, pollinators and the plants that they pollinate can go awry with disastrous consequences. And we've also found that some of our local pollinators seem to be in trouble. Um, we've seen, for example, in our studies, that sites that are very near to each other are not necessarily similar in their bee composition, diversity, or abundance, but that uh, we see very strong effects of areas not too much bigger than this room here as to being the zone of influence that seems to most strongly affect whether a bee species or individual hangs out in that area. So, for example, we're doing a study over 46 national parks, looking at the native bees in these 46 national parks. And here, like in the Great Lakes parks, we find that, you know, habitats that are uh, areas that are right next to each other in a park, but are different habitats, have much more dissimilar bee uh, communities than uh, habitats that are similar, but separated by hundreds of miles. So, for example, you know, some of the dunal habitats at Indiana Dunes and up at Isle Royale, bee communities are much more similar there than a dual community is to an inland community just maybe a few hundred yards away at Indiana Dunes. So local conditions have a big effect. We found that different factors affect the diversity, abundance, and composition of the bee community. So that different factors affect, for example, whether you have a lot of bee species or a lot of bees or just which species are present. One thing we haven't found is a direct relationship between the composition of the plant community and the composition of the bee community. So I showed you that complicated graph before, and that illustrates just how little one-to-one -one relationships there often are between the bee uh, species and the plant species. There's a lot of redundancy in the communities and the interactions, and so it's not easy to just predict, say, I know what plant species are out there, therefore I know what bee species are out there. Um, when we've looked at the effects of development, such as urban, you know, um, residential development or industrial development, here's the word for the day. Okay, so maybe you use this in the thing. Oligoleagues, which are specialist bees, in other words, bees that tend to only pollinate maybe one or two plant species. You would think that these specialized bees would be particularly sensitive to loss of native habitats. But in our studies, we actually found that many of these illegal leagues uh, were positively related to the presence of residential development in the area. And it turned out uh, that we uh, found that there was a, a relationship between disturbance of the ground and uh, the presence of some of these specialized bee species. So it's not necessarily true that you know, all development uh, would be bad for bee species. And we're going to have a talk by Emily Miner in a moment, uh, looking at the bees of um, Chicago. And we find, for example, even though we've done quite intensive studying and surveying of bees in the uh, Indiana Dunes, that there are many bee species present in the city of Chicago that we don't find in our surveys out at the dunes. So, back in 1933, this is the University of Chicago crowd, so this University of Chicago graduate student did a study of the bees of the Chicago region, and including some of the areas where we surveyed in our studies, and found almost 170 species of native bees. When we went back to a lot of these sites, we found you know, a similar number of bee species. So this might, uh, you know, these factoids that I've sort of thrown at you, uh, might indicate to you that bees, they seem to be doing okay in a variety of habitats, including developed areas. There are a lot of species of bees around. 
So everything should be fine on the pollination front, right? Well, not so quick. Uh, Vicky mentioned, for example, uh, a suite of bumblebees that seem to be doing poorly around the country. This prior survey from 1933 suggested there should have been like about a dozen bumblebee species that we found in our surveys. We found about half of those, including these species here, which have been put on the, uh, you know, the watch list as far as uh, you know, uh, becoming less and less uh, widespread. Um, one of the uh, species that we spent a special, especially uh, quite a bit of time on is this bug here, the carnivore butterfly. It's a federally endangered species. And in 1999, uh, we did a survey of the butterflies of the Indiana Dunes and uh, so nearby regions. And the carnivore blue butterfly came out to be just about the most common butterfly that we found. This is what's happened since then. Uh, last year, this year in our surveys, we were able to find two male carnivore blue butterflies at Indiana Dunes. It's on the verge of extinction in the park. And uh, this trend has been found in, uh, in some other places around the species range recently. I'll tell you a little bit about what we've discovered, why this might be happening. Uh, this just illustrates the carnivore blue's life cycle. It goes through a typical life cycle for a butterfly. It overwinters its eggs, they turn into the eggs hatch, a caterpillar comes out, it pupates, it forms, a, the adults develop from the, from the pupa, the adults mate, the females lay eggs, and they do this twice typically in a summer, in the spring and a summer. So you go through two complete life cycles typically in a summer. What we've done in conjunction with Dr. Jessica Hellman at uh, Notre Dame is that uh, we've been trying to simulate climate change effects in the lab and looked at some correlates in the field. So what we've done is we've tried to give these bugs um, elevated temperatures corresponding to predictions for the next uh, few decades up to the year 2100. And what we found is that warming accelerates development. So for two or three days of more rapid development for about every degree centigrade that uh, the temperature rises. And you might say, well, that should be good. As a matter of fact, one thing that we find is as we raise the temperature, instead of having two broods per year, they start acting three and four broods per year. And you might think, well, that's great. Uh, the only problem is that the plant species that the caterpillars eat doesn't last that long. So you get into a situation where you might start popping out extra broods, but there's nothing for the caterpillars to eat. Not only that, the adults get smaller and smaller um, as they go through these additional broods. And that means the females lay fewer and fewer eggs. But the real kicker as to why we think there might be a climate-related effect going on here was some observations we made in the year 2012. I said one of the things that's important is that timing is of the essence. And here, 2012, for those of you who were living here at that time, you might remember it was like an abnormally warm spring, like the earliest spring on record. And we follow the hatching of the eggs in the field versus the emergence of this host plant, the plant that the caterpillars eat, wild lupin. And what we found was that the eggs hatched, the caterpillars came out way before the plant emerged, days and days before. And these bugs will only live a day or two without having something to eat. We saw like probably a five to seven day lag. This is the situation in 2013 a more typical, cooler year. And you can see in 2013 that the plant and the bug were sort of coming out at the same time. 2012, we thought it was going to be a disaster, and it turned out to be just that. It brought the bug to the verge of extinction in the dunes. Uh, one other thing that happened in 2012 was that in the second brood, it got very hot and dry. And the bugs didn't survive, the plants didn't survive. The only places that the plants survived were in a few refuges in the cooler parts of the landscape. 
So the bugs got a double whammy in 2012. Bad timing in the beginning of the, in the first brood and bad timing in the second brood. And the net effect was that the bug is at the verge of extin extinction in the park. And has led us to believe that microclimatic variations, you know, differences, small differences in temperature across the landscape may play a big role in survival of these, uh, this species. Um, and one other thing that we found, and maybe this will be the last message, because uh, Abigail is raising this one finger here. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't see exactly which one it was, but wow. I just saw one. one. And um, is that something else that we've seen on the landscape that seems particularly deleterious. This is a section of Indiana dunes. And here's a scale, 100 feet. 100 feet. This is a two-lane road, OK? There are carnivu approximately where this female is. There are carnivu approximately where this male is. We've done genetic studies on this population and on this population. And we found that these two populations are genetically about as different as populations are between New York and Wisconsin. These two populations are verging on being different species genetically by genetic. And what this indicates to us is that this is a barrier that they can't get by. These are two populations that are so separated by the sort of minuscule fragmentation of the landscape that they're functioning as separate populations. So uh, I'll leave you with one, part, one parting thought here, which is that what we've learned about the, from the Carnaloo especially, is that connectivity on the landscape may be critical for survival. There's a lack of connectivity in that last example I gave you. Um, we're seeing, for example, that the projections for the Carmer Blue are that they're going to be leaving this region. Our climate predictions are, are saying that. And that there are other species to the south that are sort of waiting to come and replace the karma. And we have to provide um, connections for these species movements on the small scale and on the larger scale. And we think that that can be very important for the survival or the maintenance of biodiversity of pollinators and many other species of concern in our region. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ralph. Um, one question while we switch presentations. Yeah. Have you ever witnessed like a, a complete speciation happen with, with uh, some sort of artificial barrier like that? What we have seen in this particular case is uh, pretty much a loss of genetic variation, on, especially on the west side. And um, this divergence. So, you know, I mean, if you look at the statistics on those two sides, you know, I mean, population geneticists have certain standards, you know, of genetic differences of all species, and those two sides are verging on that. So, you know, do we see that there's been some loss of local adaptation as a, as a, as an effect of this? this uh, fragmentation effect, or that these butterflies are acting differently. We don't know. We know in the lab, for example, that there are severe effects of the kind of inbreeding that's probably occurring in these populations. I mean, we've gone with our lab colonies, for example, where they, they stop breeding after two or three years when they're sort of mating with their brothers and sisters. So um, are we seeing that in these populations? Possibly, in the sense that that might be one of the factors that's contributing to the, you know, this, this divergence, this loss of uh, genetic variability, could be actually contributing to this mm -hmm. overall population decline. But we're not seeing like, oh, well, it's one of those purple and those pink or something like that. <laughs> Great. Thanks so much, Ralph. Um, <clears throat> I always enjoy listening to, to Ralph talk about the work that they do at Indiana Dunes. Um, 
It's kind of a bummer, though. It's kind of a bummer story. I think we would agree. Um, and part of part of what this discussion is meant to be is, you know, deliberately putting out information and wanting to have the urgency of this information well known because it is well documented, but coupling it with things that you can do. Um, so we're going to transition from our wonderful but kind of a bummer story about the Carner Blue Butterfly into some work that's being done here in the city of Chicago by Dr. Emily Miner um, and folks in her lab. So Emily is a landscape ecologist at the University of Illinois at Chicago. She is both an associate professor in the Department of Biological Sciences and a research associate professor in their Institute for Environmental Science and Policy. And in her lab, um, they investigate environmental patterns at broad spatial scales and how those patterns affect ecological processes as well as systems. Some of the topics that they investigate include ecological communities and human-dominated landscapes, invasions and fragmented and urban landscapes, spatial distribution of ecosystem services, and she just finished up um, a really cool project on the effects of urbanization on pollinator services that she'll talk to us about today. So please welcome Emily. Good evening. I want to thank Abby for inviting me to this great event. I'm really pleased to be here. Tonight I'm going to be talking to you about some work that my students and I have done looking at people and their gardens and bees in Chicago neighborhoods. So some of the ideas in the next few slides will be familiar to you if you've been paying attention. Uh, the, the, both of the previous speakers have described how pollinators are declining. And there are a number of reasons for this, pesticides, parasites, and as Vicki um, spend a little bit of time on, loss of habitat. And as you all know, urbanization is one of the main drivers of habitat loss. When you remove prairies and forests and put down roads and buildings, that doesn't always leave a lot of room for all the other little critters to, to live in. And in fact, this, this study in Sweden found a linear negative relationship between the number of bumblebee species and the proportion of the landscape that was covered in impervious surface. So that's things like parking lots or buildings um, where nothing can grow. And of course, that is the dominant land cover often in cities. Our work in Chicago also supports this idea. So um, in a study that we did recently, we found a little bit under 40 different bee species in Chicago neighborhoods. And you can compare that to what uh, Ralph recently found in a, in a study they published based on um, data they collected not far away in northwest Indiana, where they found on the order of 170 species. So big, big difference over just a small area due to this dramatic change in habitat. So why does this matter? Well, we could talk about biodiversity and conservation, which of course I'm a big fan of. Or we could just be practical and acknowledge that we really need bees in cities, if for no other reason than to pollinate our crops. You probably are aware that urban agriculture has become very popular lately. It's been growing a lot over the last decade. There was a study, oh darn, I think I forgot to put the citation up here, but there was a study um, that came out just a few years ago where the authors tried to identify all of the urban agriculture that was in Chicago. And you can see these two maps showing two different kinds of agriculture sites. Here, these are the larger community gardens and urban farms. And then on the right, these are the smaller areas in residential gardens and the single plot, vacant lot gardens. And altogether, they found about 4,500 sites in the city that are growing some kind of food. So that's a lot, that's a lot of demand for pollinators. I want to talk about residential areas today because I think the residential areas can be key in providing habitat to pollinators in cities and increasing their abundance and diversity. Why residential areas? Well, they really cover a lot of land. So here you can see in brown all of the land in the Chicago metropolitan area that is classified as residential land use. And in Cook County, that's about 50% of the land area. 
If you add up all of the green space that's in people's yards and gardens in that residential land, in some cities, that green space in lawns and gardens is, actual, is actually greater than the amount of green space that's in the combined parks and preserves in those cities. So these areas can be really important ecologically. I've been working in residential neighborhoods in Chicago for about six years, and I just wanted to show you some pictures that we've taken of our field sites. You can see these aren't, these aren't barren areas. Um, some of them are really quite diverse and very beautiful. People like flowers. And so what I'm going, the results I'm going to show you on the next few slides come from a combination of several different studies that we've done over the past few years. And together, they cover about 100 different Chicago neighborhoods. We didn't measure all of the same things in all of these studies. Well, we did measure socioeconomic characteristics in, at, at every site. But then, in some sites, we looked just at the yard design and the composition. In other sites, we, we actually measured the floral diversity in those yards. We looked at the bee community in many of the sites. And then, in 25 sites, we looked at pollination. So I'm going to talk about these four elements today, people and their gardens and how they affect bees and then the ultimate um, outcome of that for pollination and how these are all related to each other. And I'll start by just talking about the relationship between gardens and bees. So the first result that, uh, that I want to show you is probably pretty intuitive. We found that neighborhoods where there were more flowers in people's gardens, then there were also more bees in those neighborhoods. So I'm talking simply about abundance, just counting the number of flowers, counting the number of bees, not paying any attention to which species they are. But um, it was a pretty, a pretty strong relationship between the number of flowers and number of bees. More flowers equals more bees. And so, you know, if you see neighborhoods where most of the yards look like this, with just turf grass and a few shrubs, you're likely to find fewer bees there than you would in a neighborhood where there's a, a few more flowers planted. The next thing we found is that the, the variety of species actually matters as well. So it's not just how many flowers, but it's how many different kinds of flowers, how many species of flowers do you have. And we found that in neighborhoods where gardens tended to have a greater diversity of flowering plants, that we also had a greater diversity of bees. So again, more floral diversity equals more bee diversity. So those are pretty intuitive results, right? No huge surprises there. Gardens with more flowers and gardens with more diverse flowers have more bees and a greater diversity of bees. But what about pollination? How, how does this fit in? So to look at this, to try to understand how pollination varies in different neighborhoods across the city, we conducted an experiment in which we brought three different plant species to yards around the city. And we called this our mobile garden. You can see a picture of it right there. The mobile garden had these three different plants that varied in their dependence on pollinators and on their attractiveness to pollinators. One of the plants in the mobile garden was a cucumber. And cucumbers are kind of an interesting plant to study because they're monoecious. That means that the males and females are in separate flowers. Now, many, that, that, that may sound, you may, you may think that sounds normal, but in plants that's not necessarily the case. Often the male and female parts are in the same flower. But cucumbers, they're separate, and so that presents just a, a slight barrier to getting the, the, pollen, the, the plant pollinated. And cucumbers are quite reliant on insect pollinators, and they've shown a 40 to 90 percent decrease in yield in the absence of pollinators. The, another plant in our mobile garden was eggplant, and this is kind of an interesting plant because it requires buzz pollination by bees to release pollen. And only certain kinds of bees can do buzz pollination. They get in the flower and they vibrate their wings in just the right way that the flower releases pollen. And it's typically bumblebees that are really good at this, and most other species can't really do it. And so for many species that go to eggplant flowers, they're not going to get, they're not going to be able to get the pollen. And furthermore, eggplant doesn't offer um, nectar. 
as, a, as an incentive to visit the flower. So eggplant is really less attractive to many, many bee species. And the third plant in our mobile garden was Echinacea purpurea, or purple comb flower. This is a native species uh, in the kind of prairies around our area, but it's also a really popular ornamental plant. It's really pretty. A lot of people like to grow it in their gardens. And Echinacea is self-incompatible. That means a flower on an Echinacea plant can't pollinate another flower on the same plant. And so that, again, presents another kind of maybe small barrier to pollination. Echinacea is actually almost completely dependent on insect pollinators. But it is also highly attractive to many species. So lots of bees like to visit it, and they come repeatedly. So we've got these three different species. And by looking at all, all three species, which really vary in how attractive they are and how much they need pollinators, we hope to get kind of a, a, a bigger picture of how pollination might vary across the city. <clears throat> So here's some results. We found that some of those, those plants in our mobile garden receive more visitors than others. So in this figure, you see the total number of visitors to the mobile garden plants on the y-axis. And these bars represent the three different plant species, with this light gray one on the left being the purple comb flower, black one the cucumber, and this one on the right is the eggplant. And you can see that the, the um, comb flower and the cucumber received a, a much higher number of visitors than did the eggplant, which is kind of what we expected, given what I told you about, about the biology of, of eggplant. If we look at the, the uh, number of species that visited each plant, we see a similar trend, much smaller numbers. But again, a greater number of bee species visited the purple comb flower uh, than did the, the cucumber or the eggplant, with eggplant uh, receiving not very many species visitors at all. But despite these differences between these three plants, the trend was the same. All of the plants benefited from having more bees around. And so we found a positive relationship in all cases for all these three plants between the, either the number of bee species in a neighborhood or the number of visitors and the pollination for the coneflower, for the cucumber, and for the eggplant. And we tended to find that neighborhoods that had Good pollination of one of those plants also had good pollination of the other plants. So I've told you that gardens with greater number of flowers and more diverse flowers have a greater number and greater diversity of bees, and that those gardens also will have higher pollination rates for three different plant species. But what about the people? These, these are the ones that are driving the, the, the gardens, what's in the gardens, the ones that are kind of managing the whole system. We know from a series of studies, uh, of social surveys that we've done of people that live in Chicago area neighborhoods, that most residents are actively modifying their yards. More than 80% of people that we asked <coughs> reported that they did some kind of landscaping or gardening in their yard and more than 75% said that they had added or removed plants in the last year. So people are, are actively managing their yard and things are, are changing kind of rapidly. We wanted to know what, it, what drives people to make decisions about their yards and whether we could predict what, what a yard might look like based on the socioeconomic characteristics of the neighborhood. So we use data from the U.S. Census Bureau to measure a number of socioeconomic characteristics about our study sites. We looked at, at the lot size in each neighborhood, the age of the houses, how many residents were renting the home, the age of residents, the number of children living in the neighborhood, the household income, and then some race and uh, ethnic variables like the percent of residents that were white, the percent of residents that were Asian, and the percent that were Hispanic. We wanted to see which of these factors would be linked to plant diversity in yards. And I'll give you just a, a second or two to maybe make your own guess before I show you the results. Because I think this is something we can kind of all relate to on, on some level. So we found that lot size was important. Neighborhoods with larger lots had a greater diversity of plants. Seems kind of obvious. If you have more room, maybe you'll, you'll plant more things. 
we found that neighborhoods where there were more renters had a greater diversity of plans, and this was a little um, unexpected. We found that neighborhoods in higher income areas had a greater diversity of plants, and that's been shown in some other studies in other cities. And we found that neighborhoods with a larger percentage of Hispanic residents had a greater diversity of plants. Now that, those results I just showed you were looking at the plant diversity um, just in a yard, so yard level plant diversity. But we're also interested in slightly larger scale patterns of diversity. So looking across a whole neighborhood, how maybe the, the plant composition might vary from yard to yard. And we wanted to know which factors might predict neighborhood level plant diversity. And then the result we found here was really surprising to us at first because the, the, the factor that best predicted the neighborhood level plant diversity was the number of people in a neighborhood. And this was actually a positive relationship, which is not something that you might expect at first. Neighborhoods with more people actually had a greater diversity of flowers. But if you think about it, I think it makes sense because, as I said earlier, people like flowers, but everyone has a different favorite plant. And so when you have a lot of people living together in a small area, they're all gonna plant their own favorites. And then you can increase the diversity that way just by having more people. So if you, if you remember, a few slides back, I told you that the floral diversity was linked to the diversity of pollinators. So if you've been, if you've been following my thread here, maybe you'll guess what's going to be on the next slide, which is that we actually found that in our neighborhoods, where there were more people, there actually were more bees. So this held true both for the abundance of bees where neighborhoods that had more people had a greater abundance of bees, and it also held true for the diversity of bees. Neighborhoods with more people had a greater diversity of bees. And I really like this result because, while it seems counterintuitive at first, I think if you kind of followed the logic with the, the floral plantings, that, that it makes sense. And, and I think it's, well, it, it's a nice um, kind of ray of hope, I suppose. We're so used to, to saying that people are ruining the planet, but you know, we're, we're doing a few good things here. An important caveat I have to make is that all of our study sites, or none of our study sites, were in downtown Chicago. So most our study sites were in residential neighborhoods in the city, often in neighborhoods with single family homes, sometimes in neighborhoods with two flats or three flats or small condos. But we didn't go into the loop at all. And so if we had, if we had expanded this, this axis here, I, I imagine this line wouldn't keep going up. It probably would have leveled off or maybe even gone back down. And that's something I'd, I'd love to do in the future. So, um, I've shown you how people affect their gardens and that depends on socioeconomic characteristics and that depends on how many people are in the neighborhood and how that in turn influences the bees in the neighborhood and then how that can have an effect on the pollination that may be occurring in people's backyards or in community gardens. I wanted to just end by bringing up this picture that I had on the first slide. I found this today while I was looking for pictures to populate my, uh, my presentation. I got this off the internet and it it came from a newspaper article from the press of Atlantic City, Atlantic City that just came out this summer. And the title of the article is Residents of Summers Point Apartments Told No More Gardens, Lawn Furniture. And so the, art the story in the article is about an apartment complex where the management decided that they no longer wanted people to be planting all these things in front of their homes, which I think is really sad because they're obviously putting so much effort into it and, and doing really beautiful things. But this, this isn't a unique story. I'm sure many of you are familiar with homeowners associations that have strict rules about what people can plant. And so I, I think, um, I guess I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say that if we, if we want to increase the diversity and the abundance of pollinators in cities, that maybe one of the best things we can do is eliminate these, these restrictions and these rules on what people can plant and instead encourage people to increase the diversity of their own yards. And so I'll just thank you for your attention, and if I have a minute, take your question. So 
So we'll take one question for Emily while we have our other speakers. Go ahead and head up here. And if we could have the lights on the projector down, that would be great. What criteria did you use? I mean, over 200 animals that you have, what criteria did you use in your, your, selecting your study sites? Oh, well, let's say there were several different studies that we looked at about 100 neighborhoods. Um, dependent on the study, sometimes we, at one point we tried to go along that we tried to stratify across um, an income gradient because we thought that income might be important. So we tried to get lower income neighborhoods and higher income neighborhoods. For the pollination study, we were really limited to who let us use their yards. So the criteria there was, will you let us use your yard? <laughs> and, and are you not too close to someone else who let us use your yard? So generally, we tried to get things spaced out, um, stratified across the income. And I'm probably leaving something out from one of the other studies. But, and so that it kind of varied depending on, on the study. OK. We'll now move into our interactive portion of tonight's event. So we have our, our three awesome speakers up here with us, and we'll um, just kind of awkwardly have a conversation <laughs> with them gathered uh, up on the stage in this in this um, in this setting. Um, a couple a couple of things that stood out to me. So first of all, I learned a lot of new words, including. Um, Oligalies, I'll be using that one at my next party. Buzz pollination, that was super interesting. Learned a lot. One of the, one of the themes, obviously, um, you know, that kind of stood out was that there are a lot of different factors that are impacting pollinators and pollinate, um, pollinating um, populations. In some ways, it almost seems like death by a thousand cuts. You know, you have um, disease and pesticides and invasive species as well as climate change. But the leading cause, as we heard tonight, is loss of habitat. And all of these other factors are really compounding um, that, that main driver, if you will. And so what I would like to do is throw out a question to um, our panel and have them each respond. Um, and then we'll, we'll open it up for audience Q&A. But it really kind of involves this theme of loss of habitat. And what is it that we, as individuals, as resident homeowners, some of us, as community members can do in terms of action. And we've heard a lot of these examples today. Um, but really, how do we embed biodiversity into our urban planning and policy in a meaningful way? How do we make our policies evidence-based? How do we insert science in a really um, effective way into what it is that we're asking our landscape architects to do, our urban planners uh, to do, as well as engagement with community homeowners to do as well. Um, we heard about working with stakeholders, um, and so I'd like to kind of focus that on stakeholders within our urban landscape. And we definitely know that cities need nature. Um, this is a, a really well-established fact, um, and we need that to continue to provide all the important ecosystem, ecosystem services, and there are many, 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 including pollination. But nature also needs cities too, and, and we heard that as a theme. And we need cities, nature needs cities, to be designed and managed in a way that can support all of the necessary functions and to be permeable to wildlife and the need to move between our buildings. That was a shout out to our theme for the evening now. To move between the buildings and through the altered landscape that we have constructed. Um, obviously, this is even more important now than ever in the face of climate change. So I'll focus, I'll focus on, on that theme there. So what are your thoughts in terms of what we can do to most effectively embed the biodiversity piece into planning and policy? Not all green space is created equal, as we've heard here tonight. So how can we really take the notion of green space and what it is that we can do in our urban landscape and just um, have it meet its full potential for both people and for nature? So. Um, I'll start with, does anyone really want to jump at that? Emily, you're in my direct line, so I'll go ahead and start with you. <laughs> well, my guess from my talk that I would probably focus on residential mm -hmm. neighborhoods. And, you want me to use the microphone? And I think that either incentives or rebates for people, rebates in terms of uh, plants that people might buy or incentives, other kinds of ways of incentivizing people to put more plants in their yard. Uh, I, think, I think that could... Could be, could be really helpful and could go a long way towards increasing the, the diversity in our neighborhoods. 
You know, we, we had that. So when the Department of Environment was in place, we actually had a really great um, program for um, sustainable backyards. And yeah. I think Center of Neighborhood Technology still runs that. And to your point, like it was, it was really great. I think it was um, part funded by a grant by US Forest Service. Interestingly though, even though we had that in place, um, there were folks who were getting pretty hefty fines by, yeah. um, by the city of Chicago for apparently um, having weeds. So, you know, their weed ordinance um, policy was not in tune or, or really kind of jiving with the fact that they were getting incentives to plant native species. And so I think the, the what are the barriers to, to having some of these um, activities and actions really be most effective is kind of an inward look at what are the what are the policies and what are some of the things that you know may not line up in terms of being able to do that really well. So Ralph, what are your thoughts? Well, I'll just riff on what you said there for a second. I think that the most effective thing that might be done um, that's not being done right now is for, um, I'll make up a word, biodiversitarians. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. I'm using it. You know, for biodiversitarians to run for public office. <laughs> Are, are you running under that, under that political party affiliation? <laughs> According to the Hatch Act, as a federal employee, I'm not allowed to endorse any political party. Oh, so, okay. Uh, so I, I, I cannot do that. Yeah. Uh, Vicki. Uh, oh, know, sorry. I, no, because um, no, to be honest, um, I went this uh, summer, I attended a meeting for a professional ecological organization called the Society for Conservation Biology. And... Um, that was sort of the theme that they had at that meeting. They started out the meeting by bringing, uh, you know, politicians, you know, local, state, federal politicians uh, to talk with us and saying how few uh, kindred spirits there were in political office who um, had, you know, taken some of the lessons that we are, you know, talking about here today, um, you know, uh, incorporating science into policy, um, and uh, that there was a screaming need if we were going to have effective policy change to have people who understood things that we're talking about today in political office. Bioversitarian. Easier said than done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I like that one quite a bit. So I think um, my answer to that would follow up definitely what, what Emily mentioned, you know, this idea of targeting residential homeowners. Um, I would expand that to look at which stakeholder actually is managing landscapes actively, um, kind of along the lines of the more continental scale work that I focus on. But if you look at an urban landscape, the vast majority is absolutely residential habitat uh, areas, and that's great. There's a lot of individual landowners, so multiple people with private plots of land. Uh, sometimes a lower hanging fruit can be influencing a municipality, a utility, a large landowner, and having them take a step. So, I mean, they're, they're both really, really important, and I think, you know, paralleling them is paramount. But for example, um, a municipal utility district or uh, the Department of Transportation or Roads in Chicago. Uh, I am ignorant right now. I don't know anything about how your roads are managed. But for example, if you know the roadsides were just mowed, um, you could change that practice and have something that might promote a landscape that's not just grass that still is acceptable with public safety on roadsides and promotes pollinators. Or if municipalities plant a plant because they all do outside of their civic buildings. What's their planting list look like? Has anyone looked at it? Could you take a peek and say, hey, this is OK, but if you added this species, you'd probably promote this pollinator. So it's these little steps that probably could be looked at very, very quickly by someone to say, hey, I looked at your planting list, and you only have two pollinator plants in it. Mm -hmm. Can you maybe put four in there? I think that would make a huge difference. And I think there are some really great programs in place to plug into. So conservation at home, conservation at work. I think a new iteration is conservation at school. Um, so if you Google any of those phrases, um, a program will come up. And essentially, it, it gives um, you know high fives to people who are doing this. You get a plaque. Um, you know, you get recognition, which I think is something really valuable for people. Um, and essentially, the idea is if, if you do it and you have a plaque in your yard and you're congratulated for it, 
maybe your neighbor's going to want to do that as well. Um, so kind of keeping up with the Joneses type of um, effect there, and it's been working really, really well in, in Lake County, for example. Um, would love to see that kind of expanded here in Cook County. I think that would really be wonderful. I'd like to open it up in the last um, 10, 12 minutes here to questions um, for all of you that have been waiting patiently in tonight's event. This is Mark Bowman. Um, flag him down if you have a question. Hi, thank you very much. Um, I have uh, two friends who have established thriving bee colonies on top of City Hall. City Hall is a planted green area, and they have found that the bees actually forage in Grand Park, which is just to the east of it. Uh, they are winemakers. They, they make mead, so they harvest the honey in order to do that. But my question is, um, to what extent do the forest preserves that uh, surround the uh, Cook County area uh, contribute to or detract from the diversity of bees or pollinators? Um. Well, I can say that forested environments are not necessarily uh, the, the environments that are going to produce the greatest abundance of bees or the greatest diversity of bees. Okay? As a matter of fact, in our studies in Indiana, we've tended to find sort of a negative relationship between canopy cover, you know, forested cover, and um, you know, a lot of bees. Okay? So in certain respects... Uh, your typical more open savanna or grassland is going to support a more diverse, more abundant uh, bee, uh, you know, bee community. Having said that, um, there are also certainly bees that specialize, for example, on certain trees uh, that you might find in the preserve district. There are spring flowers, you know, before the before the trees leaf out, you know, there are spring flowers in the understory that um, need, you know, that attract bees or that uh, the bees may nest in some of the dead wood uh, that you find in, the, in something like Forest Preserve. So it's, a, it's a, probably a bit of a mixed bag. You know, it's not necessarily the best type of habitat of forest for a lot of bee species. On the other hand, it does support, um, you know, there are certain bee species that are dependent on that kind of habitat. Sure. I think I can a little bit answer that question as well, because um, I used to work for an um, ecological contractor, uh, Peace and Associates, and mm -hmm. we worked with forest preserves. And I guess uh, the name sometimes is not accurate because forest preserves of Cook County and uh, Lake County, sometimes they do have prairie habitat. Right. Mm -hmm. And we work on a few projects when we turn more wooded areas into more open woodland savannas and like uh, oak savannas with uh, a lot of uh, prairie plants. So I think the, the name uh, forest preserve is a little bit misleading because there's uh, quite a few uh, uh, open prairies uh, within that uh, network. So. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much. Yeah, you're absolutely right. So one of the um, best uh, and most widely used tools for restoring health of some of our forest preserves is fire um, and tree removal to restore the health of the area, mainly through increasing light levels to that lower canopy. So we do have uh, prairies and grasslands right here in Cook County that are pretty phenomenal. I happen to know the... Um, one of the head ecologists who works for the Forest Preserve District, uh, Chip O'Leary, he's phenomenal and definitely has um, in his wheelhouse and skill sets um, all the information in which to manage really well for these kinds of systems. Um, yeah, as a beekeeper, I've noticed um, that the whole practice of beekeeping is pretty unsustainable, i.e. you buy packages from a bee producer. So is there any incentive or is there any way that we could promote um, not capture wild swarms, but just putting nest boxes up in uh, areas around the city, especially because that's where a lot of bees are. And is there any um, study to show about actual wild capture or wild bee swarms that you've found? I can, I can give a, a shot at answering that one because that's a great complicated question. And I'm actually glad that you brought up this idea of how bees are managed and the sustainability in the bee industry. So honeybees, different than um, native bees, 
are colonial, they live in a box, and they're really heavily managed. So this idea of wild, captured, feral bees is very limited these days, especially in North America. So to just step back quickly for a second, uh, the honeybees that are used in predominantly in agricultural pollination were imported from Europe. Their home range is the northern part of Africa, the Middle East, and um, parts of Europe. And they're a great agricultural pollinator because their lifestyle allows them to be moved around by us. So uh, they're, they're preferred because of that, not because, and they make honey too, which is great. But they're, they're, it's not because we didn't like all these wonderful native bee species. They're just difficult to manage outside of managing habitat. Um, there were feral bees very common throughout North America, but um, with the increase of varroa mite, which is a parasite of bees, feral colony numbers have gone down incredibly. So they're rare. I, you've seen swarms before probably, but in terms of their occurrence, it's not a sustainable way to collect and increase bee stock for the most part. So a lot of times when you do have collecting, you can put out hives, collecting hives that would encourage a swarm, but their capture numbers are really low. So that... That's not really an answer to your question, but it's just verifying that absolutely there is a there is an issue of the sustainability of the management of the beekeeping industry and small scale beekeepers, beekeepers that keep 16, 30 hives or less, suffer quite a bit because you have a high chance of hive failure, hives um, deciding to swarm and leave. So when you're a large scale beekeeper and you have hundreds of bees that doesn't impact you as much as a smaller scale beekeeper that if you lose 17% of you know, four hives, you basically just lost like one hive kind of. And those are the average losses. So that's. I have a question about um, this pesticide that's nicotine based that's supposed to be proven to at least contribute to the colony collapse. Do you know anything about it or? So I can speak a little bit to Nina Knoisen if you can, if you want to. So, so um, the new nicotinoids are derivatives of nicotine, and nicotine is a wonderful insecticide. Insects will not eat tobacco because they it, it, it just... So it's, it's um, an advance on the one hand in uh, technologies that really target um, pest control. The main issues with the neonicotinoid pesticides and interactions with honeybees are from the perspective that the product is a systemic insecticide as opposed to um, an insecticide that is applied aerially and is a residue on the surface of the plant. So a systemic insecticide, if you spray it on a plant or if you um, treat a seed with it, is absorbed and the entire plant becomes uh, protected with that insecticide. The problem uh, that can occur in that particular case is that products like pollen and nectar can certainly have residues of that insecticide in them because it's throughout the whole plant. And if you have a pollen and nectar feeding insect that visits a plant that has been treated with a systemic neonicotinoid, then absolutely they have a chance of interaction. Um, so that's the biology of the product. Now the Issues that were stemming from honeybee interactions with neonicotinoids were primarily through non-target impacts through the dust that was coming off of corn seeds that were treated with neonicotinoids. And corn is not pollinator dependent. It's wind pollinator, self-pollinated onto itself. Um, so you had this kind of dual issue of there's no real precaution or mandate that exists for pollinator protection in a corn planting situation because it's not a crop that is visited by um, honeybees. They do sometimes take corn pollen, but the studies we've seen, that they're not really taking corn pollen. They were interacting with the dust that was coming out of planting machines that was on these treated seeds. And that dust itself was basically carrying the insecticide onto a non-target area. Um, so there was a handful of studies, and in terms of it being a significant driver for colony collapse disorder, um, there was no definitive uh, proof. It's kind of balanced both ways, where hives that did show symptoms of CCD had, in some cases, neonicotinoid pesticides, and others did not. 
Most bee biologists believe that it's the synergistic effect of all the pesticides that bees come in contact with. So there's 190 some odd products that have been confirmed within hives. One of which, well, there's a category of about six to eight neonicotinoids. So they're certainly potent, but they're not the only thing that bees are being hit with, basically. So if you want to follow up on that. Yeah, that was, that was a tough one. I took the heat on that one, right? Okay. <laughs> Okay, great. Hi, um, I have a question from the public perception perspective. So as we plan and plant and manage for habitats that encourage pollinators, we're attracting our desirable butterflies, cute native bees, as well as what people view as undesirable pollinators, wasps, hornets, and things that invoke fear. So as we're having these discussions and making these movements, how do we reconcile encouraging these practices with the underlying fear of, but I don't want to bring these things. I want these and not these. How do we deal with that? I don't know if there's an answer. <laughs> I, I don't have an answer to your question, but I can confirm that we've seen that just anecdotally um, going through neighborhoods. We've had people tell us that, oh, there used to be some flowers right here in my yard, but there were too many bees, so we cut them down. So I think that's, that's a very real problem. And I mean, I guess I would say education probably um, but I don't know, maybe someone else has a better idea. Yeah, I mean, many people, of course, just lump every, you know, lot of different species into, a lot of different, not only, a lot of different species into bees, right? And then they assume that all those bees are going to sting you, right? Um, so uh, education, <laughs> you know, I mean, peop you know, if people learn a little bit more, you know they're going to be a little less prone to do that, but even, but even then, I mean, I've you know I've given that speech to many people, and it's effective probably in about twenty percent of the time. <laughs> yeah. And I can even follow up on that with um, not the desirable insects. A colleague of mine worked at a local conservation district and would often get calls from individuals who had planted butterfly plants, and they would call and say. I have all these beautiful butterfly plants, but the leaves are getting eaten, and I can't figure out how to stop this. <laughs> and you'd have to say, well, you know, part of the butterfly life cycle is the caterpillar. So it is absolutely education on that level. And um, we have a brochure. I actually didn't bring copies of it with me because I thought we were more of a converted audience here. But it's called No Fear of Stings, and it kind of outlines why you should not fear stings when you plant a bee garden, and that most people are stung by wasps, not bees, and that only 3% of the US population is anaphylactically allergic to bees. So for 97% of us, it would hurt, but we would be perfectly fine. Uh, that still is only going to convert like 20% of the people who will still say, well, I don't know. <laughs> So we're going to take one last question. I did also, um, I think Jim Louderman is just leaving right now, but thanks, Jim. I just wanted to say thank you. Speaking of getting to know your pollinators, Jim had an entire table of beetles that was out um, in the West Lobby before this event, and um, we invited him to do so because I don't think a lot of people know that beetles are incredibly effective pollinators. And so to your point of public perception and what, what is a pollinator and what might I expect when I plant these things, um, beetles. Right, Jim? We should be talking about all of them. Flies, yep. Um, one more thing is we just bees the pollinators. True. Right. We get all of them in the our gardens and love the pollinators. Yes, we do. Yeah. I'll say one thing that, you know, if I can, one thing that can be effective is, you know, these are fascinating animals, right? And I remember when I was in graduate school, we were hiring a new faculty member. He came in. You know, this one, the, the faculty wanted a certain type of biologist. This guy came in, he studied moth genitalia. Nice. Right? But he was the one who got hired. And how did he get hired? Is he had a whole presentation of moth genitalia and the weird shapes that they took, with the coup de gras being the one that looked like the Starship Enterprise. <laughs> Pictures of genitalia will sometimes get you hired. It's yeah. true. So last question. One more question. OK. OK. Mr. Grundle, you mentioned in your studies that there are some species of bees or pollinators that have been especially hard by urbanization, specifically bumblebees. 
But on the flip side, are there pollinators or genera of bees that have flourished in urban environments? And if so, why would that be? Right. Well, one of the points I was trying to make is that in our study, we actually found this subset of native bees that um, seem to be doing particularly well in the vicinity of you know, urban development, residential areas. Emily, Emily's list, <laughs> uh, you know, we compared her list of bees that she found in the city of Chicago to our list of bees that we found in more natural areas. And there was certainly the subset of bees that were occurring in Chicago that we didn't find in ours. So in our particular case, what we thought was the deciding factor why these certain bees wanted to like hang out in more developed areas was disturbance, especially disturbance of the soil, because many of these bees nest in the soil. And so just the process of like developing a lot for, um, you know, for building a house or some other building was actually a positive thing for, for these species. So there are certain, you know, there are certain functions, ecological processes like disturbance that we often suppress in natural areas and you know, that may occur in a developed area and sort of be a surrogate or you know, take the place of something like that. So in our particular case, we did find a subset of bees that actually seem to do particularly well in the vicinity of residential development and we ascribed it to you know, some effect of the disturbance that goes along with the development. Okay. I want to go back to the education idea. I think sometimes education can be effective if it's coming friend to friend or gardener to gardener. I had a friend who was excited she was attracting bees to her garden, but then she had some wasps. And I might have actually given her misinformation if I understand what you just said, but I, I said, oh, well, wasps are pollinators too. So maybe, and please tell me if I'm wrong, because I'll correct it with her, but point being, she decided to open up her mind to what the other pollinators might be, but I think people speaking amongst themselves might help get these messages out as well. So please tell me about the wasps. Oh. <laughs> um, it, wasps are certainly not as good pollinators as, they're, they're closely related to bees, okay? They're in the same order, Hymenoptera. Um, but they don't have some of the uh, carrying apparatus for the pollen, okay? You know, they'll actually sometimes eat pollen, and they probably sometimes adventitiously move pollen around. But uh, in general, they're not nearly as effective as a pollinator. On the other hand, you know, as was mentioned a moment ago, there are all these other orders of insects, especially like flies and beetles, um, that we don't think about at all when it comes to transporting pollen around. And, you know, many times, you know, like the, the flies are probably the dominant pollinators in a lot of systems. And we have, you know, the, we, we anthropomorphize, you know, we have our charismatic, you know, we, in ecology we often talk about our charismatic megafauna, you know, like your bison or you know, grizzly bears or something like that. Well, we have our character, charismatic microfauna as well, you know, so it's like, oh, look at that beautiful butterfly, and oh, that fly, <laughs> you know, and, uh, you know. So all those, you know, so the, high, the, the wasps are, you know, usually pale in comparison to something like a bee or many of the flower flies or many of the beetles as being effective pollinators. Well, well, go ahead. I was going to say that- I'm Christine. <laughs> okay, so I just wanna say, I'm from the shed. I wanna invite you to come walk around our gardens. Um, we invite all uh, insects. Um, I wanna remind all of us, yes, those pollinators are the sexy beasts that we all want in our gardens, but without the other green infrastructure, we don't have the predators that protect them or you know, the things that lay eggs in our hornworms on our tomatoes. So we have to just remember that it's all invited. You invite the bees, you invite the wasps. They all have a purpose to be there and we should all plant two native plants in our gardens and connect the corridor. 
Thank you. So on that note, thank you so much. I would like to thank all of our speakers and to invite all of us to one, become bioversitarians and to um, become pollinator champions. So to your point, um, you know, go out and share this information in a uh, really innocuous way, in a friendly garden conversation uh, with your neighbors, with your friends, um, and let's, let's bump up the connectivity here in Chicago. Thanks so much for joining us tonight.